Welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Lincoln from the Landscape Institute and this is Joanna Gibbons, uh, Landscape Architect. We're walking a little bit on the South Bank, but a lot of this will be away from the more familiar parts of the South Bank because we want to focus uh, not on the arts venues and those for areas for which the South Bank is most well known, but a lot of the areas south uh, which are going through major changes, major regeneration efforts, uh, and in which the landscape, the planting, and the horticulture uh, are being challenged or changed. So there's a very particular way in which all of this part of London is subject to quite an interesting set of changes, and we want to guide you through uh, all of those. There's a number of little threads that we'll keep sort of referring to. Um, and in a way, it's just taking you on a walk um, and sort of hopefully beginning to see the way we see as landscape architects our environment. So it's picking up odd things, odd bits of green infrastructure, um, talking about tree diversity, talking about regeneration. Um, there's probably a little theme that I can see from our test walk we did, which is really brownfield and burials. And um, because all parks started as something else normally in this part of um, the world. Um, and so um, there's uh, another aspect which is what is happening below ground and London has the most phenomenal archaeology. It also has a lot of stacked graves and it has a lot of city soils that are trying desperately to support all the big green infrastructure that we appreciate and, and love and make London one of the greenest metropolises in the world. So um, it, it'll be, there'll be some odd little observations which I hope you'll find interesting um, and some architectural, little architectural gems. Um, so we'll be talking about living and built heritage. And I want to say a, a quick word about South Bank because until about 1950, this part of London was basically industrial. Uh, most of the activities that took place here were connected to the Pool of London and to the docks, and until the 60s, the whole of the area over there towards Greenwich was dominated by the docks, which at that period then moved east to Tilbury uh, on the onset of containerization. What we've seen over the past 50 years, really starting with the Festival of Britain and with the building of the Festival Hall, is this astonishing period of regeneration. Um, traditionally, um, behind you is the financial quarter of London. On that side is, is the more uh, commercial, tourist and arts part of London, but with the creation of the Festival Hall and then the building of the National Theatre, Queen Elizabeth Hall and more recently uh, Tate Modern, there's been this arts led regeneration and then more recently that regeneration has been complemented by the opening of City Hall and by the creation of this very large office estate which is called More London and what we're going to see as we walk is that that regeneration is now moving towards Elephant and Castle and one of the biggest areas I suppose of change is that we're witnessing is, is the demolition of the Haygate estate in Elephant and the creation of a whole new quarter and one of the questions will be how green will that new part of London be. But what we're going to do first of all, before we go south, is just have a look at the river and have a look at the foreshore, which is that area just, just on the other side over there. So let's just go that way for a second. What's interesting about this position, and as Paul said, this, the more London, was uh, this whole estate, this site was actually blighted for many, many years in terms of planning. It's a very important position because it's right opposite World Heritage Site. Um, and World Heritage Sites are managed very specifically in terms of their context. For instance, right behind the Tower of London there is a whole load of proposals for tall buildings. They're about a, a quarter, um, a mile or so away north, but there's a huge discussion in London that I'm sure you're all aware of, and there's a very good exhibition in Store Street about the future skyline of London and the impact of the tall buildings. So at Bishopsgate, which is just north from here, there's a very substantial proposal um, being put forward um, that breaks the line of the Tower of London. So London is a massively changing city at the moment. I can't remember how many tall building applications are in the pipeline at the moment. 280. 280. Um, you know, so what is interesting is, has anyone got a vision for that? <laughs> Question mark. 
The other thing is what happens at the base of all those buildings because what they tend to do is create, you know, incredibly challenging environmental conditions that are not particularly nice to be around. Okay, now we're going to look at one of the newest uh, green landscapes, which has been uh, the landscape architects are called Townsend Architects, landscape architects, who did all of this hard landscape, but they've also installed quite a lot of planting, so we'll walk just over there. This is a, um, a very lovely approach to planting in quite a severe environment this gets very hot here and it gets very windy the trees in these kind of schemes are not here just to look pretty they're also modifying the microclimate um, and they have very very little soil this whole deck is only about 600 deep in terms of growing medium so these trees that are bought in at this size um, actually their root balls are only about that deep I saw them in the nursery being cut in half to be able to be brought in here. So what seems on the surface like it's ground, in London now more and more is not actually ground, it's podium. There's this kind of artificial landscape and I'm looking forward to seeing the so-called park that apparently is going to be on the top of the yeah. walkie-talkie yeah. because um, we're all supposed to be able to access that so I challenge everyone to try and do that in a few months time. Um, but yeah, so these are very, very highly managed gardens. They're, they're very beautifully designed. The estate is managed very carefully. It's always clean, um, and, um, but don't ride a bike around it. So the, there's, a, there's a bigger, wider issue, which is we're always interested in, is like how public is public space. And um, you know, whether you can take photographs or not yeah. is, is an ongoing issue. Um, so here we've got um, Quercus, we've got oak, and then we've got sort of uh, box hedging and lots of sarcococca and um, various other ground covers um, and ferns and so on. So uh, it creates these nice little microclimates and they're little slots between the buildings where you've got additional small scale gardens. Um, and I want to say a word about ownership, which Joanna's alluded to. Uh, this is entirely a private estate, although it obviously feels as if it's public. And if you walk from here right down to the London Eye, almost every place that you walk through is in private ownership, either by a commercial organisation or by an arts organisation. And there's, an there's a very interesting debate, not only about how you maintain and manage public and private space, but if, for example, you wanted to picket this building, which is the mayor's office, you would not be arrested by the police, you would be arrested by security guards. Whereas if you wanted to picket um, Parliament, you'd be arrested by the police. So this, this particular part of London is entirely in private ownership, and there is a very, as I said, very interesting debate about whether that is a good or bad thing, and how you, in an age of increasing austerity, how you create public spaces and particularly public parks which need to be very carefully maintained and how you pay for them and what is the price you pay if you get organisations to pay for their upkeep rather than local authorities and as we go south that is also a relevant issue because there'll be a hundred different land ownerships between here and our final destination some of them will be local authorities but only yesterday the Heritage Lottery Fund published a report saying we're facing a complete crisis in fact, here we have a copy. Um, a complete. And here, all the facts and figures. There's a, a real crisis in how we manage our parks. They're really much loved assets. They're really great places for refuge. But if there is no money to pay for them, and there is no statutory obligation to look after a park, uh, what does it mean if a park dies? Because generally, they will die in slow motion. Uh, they won't be closed down the way a school or a hospital. So. Politically, it got a lot of coverage on the TV and radio over the week. And I think as we go south, I think it's a really interesting question is who pays for them, who builds them and who maintains them. Uh, but we're about to look at a really beautiful, relatively new park, uh, which interestingly is also semi-private, but it's owned by a, a trust. And that is um, Potter's Fields, which is where we're going just over there. There's a, a, anyone who's interested in knowing precisely what the designations are of a park 
um, in London. It's size, the author, the designer. There's a brilliant website called London Gardens Online, which is uh, managed very expertly um, in collaboration with English Heritage by the London Parks and Gardens Trust. And it's just all the information you really want to know. Um, but anyway, this is designed with Piet Aldorf. And this um, is very much a continental um, type of character of planting, which um, probably moved on and inspired in some way, because this predated the Olympics, that kind of sense of having open looseness with flowers that you kind of wonder whether they're weeds or flowers, and does that really matter anyway? Um, so, and then you can see that there's a broken curb line here. And the reason for that is for drainage, for sustainable urban drainage, or suds as we call it in the trade. Um, and every local authority this, by this October is going to have to have a suds strategy. And it's about time, it's, it's decades overdue, which talks about how we reuse um, and manage our water more sustainably, rather than having it career over the top of a surface and straight into a sewer. Um, and that is a reason why in the river, 70 metres below, very shortly, they'll be building 4.2 billion pounds worth of tunnel, a, um, a new sewer, super sewer, called the Thames Tideway Tunnel. Whereas if we all had sponges all over the city, you could imagine it could be very much more effective. So this, this is an important detail. And then as you break into the more intimate areas, the curb line drops away and then the drainage flows just straight into the, um, into the planting beds. And this was a pottery, this site. So uh, the clay alludes to that. Um, and uh, it, they're very beautiful sort of long benches, which are characteristic of the landscape architects um, sort of design style. Um, and, and some beautiful gates that we'll have a look at. This was a burial ground. This space and the next space we're going to, were, uh, there were stacked graves. Um, and before that, they were um, archery grounds and things like that. So there's no place in London virtually that hasn't been touched before. So it's what we call brownfield. Um, it means there was occupation before, and that makes it very interesting. Um, at the start of a project when you're investigating all those kind of hidden secrets. We'll, we'll go up to the gates now. Um, uh, before Joanna talks about the significance of this wall, um, there's an issue about who manages spaces I mentioned earlier. And in a lot of places in London, uh, there are organisations called Business Improvement Districts and the one here is called uh, Team London Bridge and the Business Improvement District, it's an idea that was invented about 30 years ago in New York, um, is to supplement the activities of the local authority by getting local businesses to work together. They then pay a supplementary rate and that supplementary rate is used for projects which are of common benefit. And for the first few years, um, a lot of those projects would be around things like map making, new signs, um, safety, uh, new lighting, yeah, cleansing. Uh, but increasingly, and I think it's a very interesting move, business improvement districts like the one here have invested in green infrastructure projects um, because that is you know, part of the public realm that we share. And here is a very splendid example. Well, we've got two types. Behind you is a big old plane tree. That is a phenomenal piece of green infrastructure. That tree in itself has got, in terms of biomass, in terms of um, taking, up, um, filter, taking up water, modifying the climate um, of the city, is doing more than any man-made kind of unit could possibly do. Um, so the trees, we, we got about 20% canopy cover in London of trees, which I think is the greenest city. Um, and uh, so they are big, what we call large species trees are incredibly important to making our city livable. And the other end of it, that's doing its thing. It's been sitting there still 
without any irrigation, just growing away steadily. This one, on the other hand, is another piece of a different type of green infrastructure. You can see it's built out of a cellular material with little po tiny pockets of, of soil, and it relies on irrigation dripping through this. But it's a, it's a really nice um, uh, fashion, if you like, in creating these soft, thick, tactile, vertical surfaces. So when we talk about green infrastructure, we're talking about green roofs, we're talking about street trees, we're talking about little pockets of um, planting, and we're talking also about green walls. And this part of the, um, and the old St. Olaf's estate was quite, quite grim at ground level, so it kind of brings a, a, an extra bit of interest. Softens it. Yeah, softens, softens it. it. So we're just going to go into St. John's churchyard now. Oh, you want to talk about that? <laughs> this, this was a, a Hawksmoor church here behind us that was bombed in World War II. Um, uh, and uh, then about 100 years ago, this, this uh, grave uh, churchyard was turned into a public park. And that's a common pattern for a lot of open space um, in London. And we came, uh, we were engaged by Southwark to um, upgrade it and um, work with the local community around um, because it was, it was in a sad, sad state. Um, so we, um, we basically worked with the historic path system and um, brought in this idea of having planting beds, which was very, if you look at all the uh, parks a hundred years ago, uh, typically sort of circular beds with bedding plants. Now bedding plants is not a very sustainable way of planting, takes quite a lot of um, maintenance. This garden will be taking all the rainwater off this surface and broadly in terms of green infrastructure we can start talking about that being a rain garden which is a kind of another part of green infrastructure. So that planting is working rather than having boggy grass you take it in and it irrigates um, the plants. This really was a down and out place. We opened up that boundary and put a decent railing along there. It was just chain link before and made these invitations, if you like, these sets of stairs so that there was more of a link between the housing and the park. It's very, very simple moves. It's nothing, no, not rocket science, but then at the opening of the park we gave everyone um, window boxes and we had a kind of potting up session so that there would be that sense that you break down the boundaries between the estate and the park. And the other thing is that we opened up um, a gate on the other side of the park so that we could see that this was before more London was opening, that there was a strong what we call in the trade desire line. So people were kind of coming through here and up there or walking through the estate. We thought it was much nicer that they walked through the park to the riverside. And this in the morning is a very busy through route. So the part of the green infrastructure is actually to make nice green routes to work or to school. It's a simple thing of looking strategically at where you can link spaces. And it might be just taking down a wall, opening up a gate, but it's so that you don't have to walk along the streets. You can walk through the parkway system. And that's what the All London Green Grid is about, which is a mayoral strategy um, embedded in the London plan, which is, is all about looking at our green infrastructure first and saying to developers, that's what we want. Those are the connections and that's the amount of open space we want. This is your bit here and you have to contribute to that. So um, all these little pieces, they add up to quite a lot of asset, um, but it's no good if it's not properly linked. So we'll, we'll go through this way. So Southwark's fantastic in terms of its parks and it really, this is an old, uh, very old um, open space um, which was in a very sad state of repair um, 15 years ago and as part of the kind of broader 
community benefit of the More London scheme. There, were very, there was a substantial Section 106, which is basically a lump of money that the developer gives to the local authority to spend on projects that are going to give wider benefit to the community. So what the, the um, Southwark did here, which seems so simple, but you can see how successful it is, they opened this up to the street. So they took away the railings here, which is quite a bold statement because, you know, in London everyone likes, there's a kind of tradition in having the parks railinged off. And so just to open that up and then create a place for sitting um, and to open it and not have gates on it and to make a kind of more generous space here um, rather than the traditional thing of having a path just going to a gate that's narrow is kind of a really nice move. Um, and there's various artefacts in this park like the spire of um, St Olaf's Church but I don't think we'll go and see it. No, we've, no, got, no. we've got other things to see but it's well worth coming back and having a wander around. And do take a look at the very interesting shop fronts as we walk down the street. So really, there's a lovely grain to this street. We've mapped this. There are very narrow units, you can see, and very nice shop fronts. Um, and and um, over there, you would just see the, the kind of contemporary form of railings, which is the front of the White Cube. And that's the largest of three galleries that the White Cube have in London. Uh, it's recently opened. And it's kind of this thing that you were talking about, Paul, which is about, you know, cultural regeneration. If an art gallery comes to town, as it were, uh, it normally is um, the beginning of quite a lot of new activity. So we'll walk down to the bottom to, and just before the street turns, we want to stop and just show you a really lovely um, special building just at the bottom there. And just a very quick stop to say time and talent settlement is a really interesting um, idea which was, um, as you see, established in 1907 to get girls out there and um, uh, doing things and being uh, kind of active members of society rather than just being obedient and pretty. And this is what this was set up to do, was to give, to foster the talent of girls so they could go out there and be useful and, um, uh, and, and offer their services in various different ways. And it was an amazing place, hostel in the war, when um, there was a lot of people in this part of the world obviously lost their homes and so on and they took them in and uh, looked after them. So on our theme of churchyards, um, I just, we just wanted to quickly come by this one. Um, that uh, These spaces are incredibly important, as I said, to the green infrastructure of London. And there are um, a lot of very interesting people who have been buried here. And, um, and so the tombs give you those stories about the previous communities and wonderful people who have contributed to the neighbourhood over the time. Um, and um, when we, when, as landscape architects, when we're working in these sort of environments, we have to, we have to be very careful that we work very, with a very light touch because some of the stack graves in, in these places um, are very close to the surface. Um, so it's, um, it's rather marvellous when you see people lying on the grass and then you think of all the people who are lying below it and it's just kind of a wonderful uh, ongoing <laughs> sort of <laughs> cycle. <laughs> Uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of reserve in London that's not, um, it's not used effectively. There's about 190 hectares of uh, social housing land in Southwark, for instance, which is just mown 24 times a year and is not doing anything else. So, you know, that's a hell of a big park, isn't it? I mean, Battersea Park is 80 hectares, so 198. So there's a lot of potential in London for uh, new parkways and green links. Oh, see, look at this. Isn't that great?
great. Yeah, wow. I don't know who's instigated this, but they've got a tap there, so they've got their, their watering sorted out, and, um, and that is a really fantastic use of space, which otherwise <laughs> is just um, criminal, really, that it's not being used. It's nicely protected with a fence, so that's, that's a very good example. Um, I just, with regard to that 190 hectares of space that is, um, could be utilised much more fruitfully, whether it's for urban agriculture or for orchards or for um, rain gardens or for play, if you look right here around us, we've got, there's kind of quite a lot. It could be that it's meadows, you know, there's some nice buttercups there. Maybe that was inten intentional or maybe not. But all these kind of what, what we term sort of nebulous green bits all together have um, an amazing potential. Um, there's also, with those green bits, there comes the sides of buildings and that's a great potential in terms of creating huge green walls. And again, there's a kind of very simple way of doing green walls, which is just to put climbers at the bottom of them and then they just do their own thing. That's also a green wall. So there's a kind of technical side to green infrastructure. And there's really just a very much a common sense approach, which is nice because it means that all of us can actually do something ourselves. We don't need to employ landscape architects like me, but... <laughs> Um, but you're not meant to say that. No, no. But I, I think there is the need for everyone to get involved and and feel that there is, in terms of climate change and so on, that we've all got the potential to to do something, and that's quite a nice feeling. So, uh, just to give you a little introduction, I'm I'm Richard Reynolds. I'm a I'm a local resident. So I'm not a landscape architect. Um, but like many rounds here, and more and more of us around here, I live in a tower block. So I don't have a garden and I've made the public realm um, my garden for the last decade. And whilst we're not going to look at those patches chronologically, um, the green infrastructure on the edge of this loop in the red route is one of the first ones that I began planting in August 2005. Where we're standing is a borderland by many measures. Um, the obelisk and, and the remnants of the Georgian architecture were laid out as the gateway to South London in the uh, late 18th century. Um, and as is often the case with borderlands, is, is they, they're the least important bit. Unless they're a gateway, like the obelisk was, once, once the borders become kind of irrelevant, um, it's, it's a fringe. And a lot of what we see here is still very neglected. And this has only opened up in the last um, nine months. This was a, a derelict ruin for, for decades. It's now been refurbished by the, the university. Um, this is poised for redevelopment, a massive tower um, developed by Barclay Homes. The student accommodation obviously went up in the 90s with fairly low aspirations for architectural merit. Um, and there's a, another tower being mooted for being built over the railway sidings there which means that this space is poised for improvement too because Section 106 money and the ambition of the area um, sort of demands it. The hard landscaping dates from the mid-1990s when the gyratory at the Elephant of Castle was um, improved to incorporate a, a bus route up this road. It had been one way from 1959. Um, and so quite high quality real stone was put in but um, a major design flaw at the time was that it didn't take into account desire lines. So you'll see as we pass it from the south, you're, you're sort of encouraged to, to walk into this you know, bowl, but there's nowhere to go. And the students in their block naturally then climb up onto the curb and make their way across three lanes of traffic. And it's, it's, a, nasty, it's a nasty location. So there are plans to significantly remodel this. Nine years ago, when those beds that we're looking at were compacted mud. It, it didn't look like a garden, it, was, it looked like concrete. There were just the two cordial line growing. Um, I decided to start digging it up one evening and with a lot of um, trial and error because the location is very windblown from the wind coming down Westminster Bridge Road, a lot of litter, a lot of exhaust, um, 
no, no maintenance from Transport for London or Southwark, who would be the vested interests in it. Um, we've now got a, a, a pretty tough landscape of relatively low maintenance. Um, Bay, Pittosporum, uh, New Zealand flax and a, a salvaged Christmas tree, which is doing really well this year. Uh, my wife and I decorate that in the week before Christmas. We've done that for about five years now. Um, it's, it's a fabulous space at some points in the year. It's fairly green, but structural, adding to the, the scale of the area. So you get a good vista as you're driving or cycling towards it from the, from the west. So we're, what we're going to do is walk past it and along Westminster Bridge Road to the largest space, which is also a gorilla garden. Um, all sorts. The lavender here is all from New Covent Garden. Bar market. Um, some of them donated. A few beer cans. That is a big part of the job. OK, um, so we're standing in what we call the, the London Lavender Fields, which um, is also a gorilla garden. Um, and again, it's a borderland. The boundary between Southwark Council and Lambeth Council is a cycle path that cuts through the middle of this bed. Um, and we're also, again, on the, on the border of the Waterloo and South Bank Neighbourhood Forum, um, a bit beyond the Elephant Opportunity Area. In March 2006, um, the beds behind you didn't exist, and these two triangular beds were just turf, like Joanna was describing earlier, just sort of scrappy grass, which is better than tarmac, but um, certainly doesn't do much for the, the joyfulness of the environment or the biodiversity. And the cordyline were, were there again, <laughs> the standard municipal planting. So the guerrilla gardening by that point had gathered quite a lot of momentum and I had a lot of people keen to help out. So over four nights in March 2006, we dug up that turf and planted a lot of what you see here now. Um, the lavender all went in then as tiny little um, shrubs, sm smaller than this, this bag. Um, and on one evening, I invited people to just bring whatever they liked. So um, anarchic in design, really. And then over the years, a lot of plants have been donated. The irises came from um, a volunteer who was working in RHS Wisley. Um, this came from a, a, a rock musician and his girlfriend who got engaged and didn't want it in their garden. Um, we've got Christopher Woodward of the Garden Museum donated a miniature apple tree. A resident of Brook Drive donated that apple tree. Um, the festuca and a lot of the low plants in those beds was once on the side of the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square. But I had a contact who was dismantling it and delivered um, a lorry load of, of plants that would have otherwise been binned. So th there's a lot, of, um, a lot of memories here. I also met my wife here and I proposed to her here as well. <laughs> so it's a very significant space. Um, and it, still, there's no contracts. No, TfL, Southwark Lambeth wanted to re-engineer this road. There's no reason for them to, to, to discuss it with me at all. The soil is only as deep as the beds. It, there is nothing beneath it. And despite that, you know, this, this is an autumn flowering cherry um, and there's a fever tree down at the end. They're, they're doing pretty well. Um, haven't watered here for years, uh, but we dig over the soil and, and you know, mulch it from time to time. And it, it's generally all right. There have occasionally been emergency pruning sessions to reduce the transpiration of the, the, the Fertinia. That's been packed back by me uh, a few weeks ago. We're clearing out some of this to um, renew the planting. Only big problem is rosemary beetle. Um, the lavender has been savaged at it in some years and, and progressively we've taken sections out and added in a bit more, bit more diversity. There's no suggestion that this is being redeveloped, unlike the last one. I, I can imagine this here for years to come. But the local authority with the last, with the, with the last one that we saw, have they not said, have they not recognised that there's a kind of, that, that um, the brief for the... Uh, reinvention of that space should acknowledge that piece of social... No, absolutely no. not. No. Um, sadly, um, my relationship with Southwark Council is bad. It's, it's, they're just very dismissive and uninterested in, in, in what happens. Um, it's quite different with Lambeth, who, who are responsible for the other half, who you know, invited me year after year to talk about what I do to their contractors, their chief executive, enthusiastic gardeners. It's shaped their 
scheme called Freshview, which in, in, enables people to plant in streets. You know, the fact is nowadays, with the, with the sort of economic situation, you cannot afford to be wasteful of people's enthusiasm. So you would have thought there'd be a strategy just for collaborative work, wouldn't you? The honeysuckle is particularly fragrant at the moment. Okay, um, well, welcome. This is the Elliott's Row Pocket Park, which is a very new development um, that I've been um, initiating. Uh, just to give you context, I, I live in that block, so that's where I've been for 10 years. So you can see there's no gardens, although we do have these communal balconies. Um, and this was a bomb site after the Second World War. Um, there's pictures of it in the 80s with huge ad hoardings up here. People used to dump mattresses on it and it was just a you know, grot spot. Um, it had the sleepers and the, you know, the significant landscaping was done about a decade ago, partly funded by Harry Potter, who filmed in this street and paid the Tenants and Residents Association uh, you know, a load of money for that and gave them free VHSs just before VHSs were phased out. <laughs> So what we're looking at is not a park. This is not part of Southwark Council's open spaces strategy. It's not, not, not a park at all. We just decided to you know, borrow the buzz phrase of pocket park and call it one. We began guerrilla gardening here in the autumn of 2011. And the bulbs did very well. And that made us more ambitious. And we realized that unlike a lot of the guerrilla gardens, because this is on an estate and there is a, there is a maintenance schedule, albeit a fairly brutal one, that we weren't going to be able to do something as, as, as ornamental as this um, if we didn't get permission. So through the housing office, we negotiated in a one email a contract. And I had a meeting here with the head of cleaning services to back off. So they sweep it and they don't do any more gardening. Um, there's no funding. We've raised £1,900 from a grant from the Co-op Bank, and that paid for bags of fresh soil, all the, all the planting except you, you see the big, obviously the big green shrubs and, the, and the, the, the honey locust trees. And it also paid for the removal of a ridiculous um, arbor that was completely covered in, in ivy. It was a very thuggish piece of landscaping that created a sort of, you know, a, a secluded corner. So we are designing out crime, I believe is the buzz phrase, making it much more welcoming and, and it paid for this signage. And learning from community gardens I visited in New York, we've covered it with a smattering of the world's languages to very directly say, look, everyone is welcome here. Um, there's a web address where people can sign up. So everything we do has to be done in a way that we know we can, we can look after and with nothing. Yeah. Um, and it's about bit by bit by bit. So this has gone really well. Um, it hasn't been vandalized. Um, we've bought a hose pipe. Um, it's filled me with more ambition to clear out more of the bigger, bleaker shrubs. Um, that's sort of where we're starting. One day maybe we could do something more interesting on the wall than just a mural. But it's, it's step by step by step. That, that's, a, that's what I've learned is yeah. sustainable when there's Absolutely. very few resources. You cannot do the grand landscape, you know, roll it out, bish bash bosh, because um, you might bite off more than you can chew. Yeah. That's, the big, that's the big fear. <laughs> We're at Perinet House. Um, I began guerrilla gardening here a decade ago. That was empty. The bit by the front door was empty. Some of this was very overgrown with you know, the usual buddlier brambles. And very progressively, um, bits were cleared and replanted. And everything except the Virginia creeper on the back wall is, is what we planted. Gradually replaced, as and when we felt you know, it was manageable. And it's now very low maintenance. It's, mainly a case of picking up litter. We are in the, the base of a wind tunnel. As Joanna said earlier, these are challenging locations. You get spiraling plastic bags, very heavy traffic area with all the buses, but um, you know, it defies um, pessimism in, in, in terms of how well this is respected and not, not damaged or, 
pinched by, by all those who linger here. And just to point out a few of the, pl the plants and their stories, um, we have an apple tree which is falling down with the weight of the fruit. That came from the pop-up urban orchard on Union Street from a few years ago. And that magnolia was salvaged from um, a tree pit near Tabard Street that we passed where it was dying, um, with permission, I should point out. Um, the lilac there was donated with some cash from someone in New Hampshire in the States who heard about what we were doing and said, you must plant a lilac. It went in quite early, which is why its position is a bit odd. It's a bit far forward, so might need to adapt that. Um, yeah, all sorts of bits and bobs that um, has been chucked in as and when it's been available, which is why it's a very haphazard uh, aesthetic, but it, 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 it kind of works. So I think that that is now the end of my ramble um, and, and Joanna and Paul and we're going to head back to the studio for lunch. So thank you very much. Well, someone's had fun. Look at that. That's the main job. And there's a snail inside. Two, three snails, wow. They just call that a slug pub, don't they? But that really is a slug pub, I think. Oh, recycling, very good. Ugh.